Hello, I'm Kathleen Newman from Maine Historical Society. Thank you for joining us for another virtual program. It is January 27th, 2021. And this is our book talk on merchants of medicines with uh, Zachary Dorner. Zachary is the assistant clinical professor in the University Honors Program at the University of Maryland College Park. And this evening he joins us to talk about his book, Merchants of Medicines, The Commerce and Coercion of Health in Britain's Long 18th Century. Thank you for sharing your time and your expertise with our audience. Zachary, I know they join me in welcoming you. Oh, thank you, Kathleen, and thank you for having me here this evening. I'm so glad to be remotely speaking at the Maine Historical Society, a place I've spent numerous hours working and speaking about a place, Maine, to which I have many personal and historical connections. Well, that's, uh, that's great to hear, and, and we're very happy to have you with us. So I'm going to I'm going to share my screen, turn off my video, um, and uh, you're, you'll be seeing uh, your presentation slides in just a moment. All right. So my talk tonight is going to focus on the 18th century, and I want to start with a particular incident in 1774. This is a year after the Boston Tea Party and before the Declaration of Independence. It was a tense time across the British Empire, an era defined by historians as one of imperial crisis, when many reconsidered their position within the empire and with a lot of local consequences, as we'll see. On September 23rd, 1774, Dr. Sylvester Gardner fled his house along the Kennebec River, narrowly eluding a mob hunting tea and Tories, and by Tories, I mean those with seeming pro-English sentiments across the Kennebec Valley. Following the Tea Act, and the subsequent coercive acts, nascent cries for liberty merged with latent anti-monopoly and anti-Anglican sentiments in the region. Jacob Bailey, the reverend at Gardner's church in Pennelborough, you know, now Dresden, Maine, recounted that he was variously harangued, assaulted, and shot at during those fraught days. Around midnight on the 23rd, an estimated 150 men brandishing axes and clubs surrounded Gardner's house near the river. Some forced their way inside where they drank several gallons of his rum. They rifled through Gardner's personal papers in hopes of finding clues to the whereabouts of the tea and other goods they presumed he had hidden nearby. The mob also flung Gardner's most reliable surveyor, John Jones, head first into the Kennebec and dragged him about till he was almost torn to pieces, according to Bailey. First-hand accounts such as Bailey's here are notoriously difficult to interpret, given the subjectivities involved, right, the perspectives and biases, especially when uh, only a few accounts of a particular event remain. So from this event, we can extract a few things, right, as a historian. We can extract that it was an angry group, and a, most likely a violent one, clearly worked up about local issues, and informed of larger ones too. And of course, there are several ways uh, that we can interpret this event. But for our purposes, and my purposes here tonight, we can say it highlights Sylvester Gardner as an intriguing target of resentment, which has a lot to say about the development of the medicine trade and of settlement projects in Maine. Sylvester Gardner, uh, and Kathleen, you can go to my first slide here. Or the next, yeah, there we go. Uh, and here you can see a portrait of Sylvester Gardner painted by John Singleton Copley around 1772. So just sort of take in his aura here, right? The sort of the standing and the presence he's trying to uh, portray through this painting. So Sylvester Gardner, right, you seen here, was trained as a surgeon, a skilled one at that, if the accounts are to be believed, who also bought, sold, and produced medicines in bulk and bought into the Kennebec Company, who were a group of land speculators who owned large tracts of land along the Kennebec River. As one of the principal landowners in the valley who controlled much of local trade, Gardner made an obvious target for the northern backcountry's frustration in the 1770s. This is incident from 1774 embodies the long-standing dispute between the settlers who worked the land and the proprietors who owned it. And it certainly wasn't the first time he had been thus targeted. In 1761, 
right, just over a decade prior, a band of settlers approached Gardner's residence in an attempt to intimidate him. The mob, quote, yelling of Indians in the night paused before Gardner's home and demanded him, as an anonymous pamphlet recounts, quote, for their cruel sport. So perhaps there is something universal about renters raising their fists at landlords. But, you know, there's more we can get at here. Dramatic as it may seem, this was not an entirely atypical experience for a landowner at the time. But how do we think about, right, how did Sylvester Gardner, a European trained surgeon, end up in such a position? A version of this question, right, how did, how did Gardner end up at the sort of the confluence of all these different threads was one that motivated my book, Merchants of Medicines. And in the process of researching and writing that book, I, the answer I learned involves money, trees, medicines, bladders, and the kinds of connections and luck required for successful transatlantic trade. Especially though, the answer involves the emergence of a new kind of large scale, scale healthcare tied to the plantation economy and returning big money under the right circumstances. So some of you attending tonight, perhaps many of you may already know of Gardner, right? He's certainly a known figure in Maine history, but I wanna use his background in medicine to do something a little bit different than usual. I want to talk about Gardner the surgeon and medicine importer not Gardner, the wealthy land speculator. Um, though these, right, these multiple sides of his professional life are clearly connected as, as I'll talk about. Gardner was born in 1707 on his family's estate in South Kingston, Rhode Island. An early interest in plants coupled with his patrimony enabled him to seek a medical education first in Boston and then Europe, where he studied for eight years in the surgical halls of Paris and London where he learning the newest techniques for removing gallstones and bladder stones. And this was a pretty difficult and actually quite common uh, affliction at the time. Upon returning uh, to Boston in 1734, he opened his own surgical practice, finding regional renown, performing a difficult surgical technique known as lithotomy for removing bladder stones. And within a decade, he had branched out into importing, making, and selling medicines. There were few professional boundaries or credentialing as we can understand them today at the time. These porous boundaries between occupations, um, so there were, there, were these, there were porous boundaries between occupations that today we might expect to be separate, right? Surgeons, pharmacists, physicians, right? all of these, you know, these, these categories were very sort of fluid um, at the time. Right? And, and these porous boundaries provided circumstances where Gardner could inhabit many of these roles at once. By some accounts, he also became the leading apothecary in colonial New England, selling to a range of institutional and individual customers. And by this, I mean ships in the harbor, the governor's daughters, military regiments, farmers, et cetera. And I'll talk about that in greater detail. He dined with Boston's leading merchants, played cards with members of the Quincy family, and had his portrait, right again seen here, painted by Copley. He also leveraged his connections and expertise to connect the transatlantic medicine trade to land speculation and resource extraction uh, in New England as a proprietor of the Kennebec Company. I hope you can already surmise that Gardner was hardly your run-of-the-mill apothecary, surgeon, vendor of medicines. So then how can we understand the standing of a surgeon making and selling medicines, right? How can we understand his standing? Again, he's certainly not your run-of-the-mill operator, but Gardner is also indicative of larger trends in the medicine trade in the evolution of something resembling the kinds of modern take this for that healthcare we're familiar with today. As the global trade in manufactured medicines took off in the 18th century, it took individuals in colonial spaces like Gardner to help it do so. He was part of what made the trade stick or what helped over time entangle it in local economies and colonial schemes. So now I'm gonna to turn more toward healthcare at the time and medicines to set up that part of this. So to unpack the role of medicines in Sylvester Gardner's story, we have to start with the body and specifically the very individualized view of it that had begun to change by his time. In Europe for millennia, 
Staying healthy meant achieving one's optimal balance of the four humors, phlegm, collar, blood, and bile, according to one's unique bodily composition of them, which was called one's constitution. In the face of a variety of environmental and bodily events that would disrupt it, a very fragile sort of balance. Health in this framework was a matter of internal balance rather than one of cures. A night of carousing or a sexual encounter, even a foul mood, could disrupt one's humors and thereby lead to sickness. An idea that does not perhaps seem so strange given our current understandings right of the mind-body connection of the, our understandings of environmental factors on our health. Within such a physiological view, health and illness were not strictly oppositional, nor were avoiding pain or curing an ailment necessarily the goals of healthy living. Rather, the aim was to keep or restore balance, which required a personalized interpretation of bodily signs, followed by diagnoses and prescriptions to re-equilibrate one's humors and thereby achieve one's optimal balance. So I want everyone to think for a second, think for a moment about how laborious such an approach would be, right? especially when deployed at the scales demanded by early modern empires. Right? I often have students consider their health in terms of this very personalized humoral way when I teach. And perhaps it seems graspable and understandable at the individual level, but if you then extrapolate that to the institutional level or to the scales demanded by empires, it can become you know, quite daunting and anxiety inducing to sort of think at that level. So the humoral focus on individual health ran up against the labor demands of empire during the 17th and 18th centuries, when attempts to wrest control of territory and access the real and imagined bounty it offered provoked large scale movements of people. More than 12 million African captives alone were forced onto ships across the Atlantic during the Middle Passage. Between 1688 and 1815, the British Royal Navy mobilized roughly 500,000 men, volunteer and impressed in wars against France and Spain. The army and trading companies sent scores more overseas to face new disease environments, while European settlers traveled to new spaces where their bodies were seen as in danger of transformation in foreign landscapes and under unfamiliar stars. Despite novel threats to the mind, body, and soul, death acknowledged neither skid nor rank and remained a constant companion in terrifying new guises. High rates of childhood and infant death, as well as the ever-present funerary rituals in early New England, made real the nearly ubiquitous fear that even the slightest difficulty could become something dire. The political, economic, and mental components of health made it such a pressing issue at the time, and one that stretched across great distances and concerned scores of people, both free and unfree. I'll provide one more example of sort of this transition that we're seeing here. So during the Nine Years' War, which was fought from 1688 to 1697, so you know, roughly a century before, right, we're talking about Sylvester Gardner, an abundance of sick men overwhelmed the English army's medical service, while disease disrupted successive expeditions to the Caribbean. Naval forces abandoned an attack on the French island of Martinique in 1693 after fever decimated sailors across the fleet, despite the use of medicines aimed at the four humors furnished by the London College of, uh, College of Physicians. Soon after, in 1695, Several ships undermanned due to disease sank on the return voyages from the region. Based on these military failures, the Lords of the Admiralty began to reevaluate the Royal Navy's medical supply to avoid repeating the recent misfortunes. They sought more economical and more reliable remedies that departed from the humor humoral logics of the physicians' medicines that had apparently failed them during the war. The Admiralty sought simpler medicines that would not require the kinds of complex individualized care right, that were required under a humoral interpretation and could thus be applied more broadly for curative instead of rebalancing purposes. Manufacturers then jumped at the opportunity to lobby the Admiralty for a contract, recognizing that the Navy could invest substantial sums in efforts to keep its sailors and soldiers alive. So under these geopolitical circumstances then, the longstanding idea that ill health came from internal imbalance 
began to see competition from another view, that diseases had essential qualities of their own and attacked the body from outside. Uh, next slide, please. And here in this print by the famous English satirist Thomas Rowlandson, we see a wonderful example of, you know, put into visual symbols of what this means, right? That diseases had essential qualities of their own and attacked the body from outside. In the middle of the print, we can see a representation of fever menacing the poor man huddling by the fire, right, on the left side of the image. And so that blue creature grasping the man is a representation of egg, what we would now sort of understand to be malaria, which was endemic uh, to certain sort of marshy, the fens, right, regions of England at the time. But, right, instead of an internal imbalance of the humors, we now see disease as these, you know, figurative monsters threatening patients, threatening individuals from outside of their own bodies. Right, and such an idea, you know, carried many material advantages at the time. It made it simpler and more cost effective to manage the health of groups, especially those such as bound laborers or impressed seamen who had less of a choice about what went into their bodies, but whose manpower right, and labor were very important to the operation of empire. It contributed to the infrastructure of a commercializing medical marketplace for curative products across Europe and its colonies. Right, seeing illness as an ontological matter, right, as a thing unto itself, external to the body, no longer as an internal one, popularized medicines that could be taken specifically for the treatment of particular diseases with the goal of curing them. In this way of thinking, right, then we can see how that can lead to new ways of making and marketing medicines, new ways of purchasing them, transporting them, applying them, and new printed texts by notable researchers, including Thomas Sindenhan, Herman Borjava, and Carl Linnaeus, classified and characterized diseases, uh, right, just as Linnaeus classified plants, he also began to classify diseases in a much similar way. Uh, and remedies known as specifics were taught in Europe's most prominent medical schools. Larger patient groups, uh, such as those on a sugar estate or a ship of the line, could be more conveniently treated with medicines designed materially and conceptually to be administered to groups of people. Faced with easily communicable and infectious diseases, such as malaria and yellow fever that could move quickly through a proximal population, colonial medical practitioners found prepackaged medicines designed to treat a certain disease much simpler and cost effective than the more time consuming and patient centered process of reading someone's humoral balance, especially in context of dehumanizing power imbalances. And during the same period, credit based finance underwrote greater manufacturing and exportation capacity of these medicines in Europe. Partnerships of apothecaries, chemists, and druggists coalesced in mid 18th century London to service overseas demand for healthcare by producing in bulk medicines capable of being transported across oceans without spoiling and applied more or less uniformly to groups of people believed to be suffering from similar ailments. Next slide, please. And these are two images taken from my book that give a broad sort of overview of the expansion of the medicine, transatlantic medicine trade in the 18th century. And you, you know, this slide will be up for a little bit. Uh, so take a, take a moment to keep looking at it. But the top image shows the sort of expansion of letters concerning the medicine trade and correspondence crossing the Atlantic during this period. And the graph below sort of shows the overall general increase in medicine exports from England at the time. And as we can see, right, medicine exports rose exponentially during the 18th century, achieving a scale and a coherence not yet seen. The nearly 5% annual growth rate amounts to quite a large increase over the decades, as you can see in the bottom graph. Right, envision here for a moment the connection between the promise of more profit, bigger production, in wider distribution. These trends both pushed and were pushed by institutional contracts, new production capacity, financial instruments, colonial wars, and new ways of thinking about the body and disease. And this is, I find, the germ of big pharma as we talk about it today. GlaxoSmithKline, for example, 
which along with Sanofi holds the largest US government contract to produce a COVID-19 vaccine under Operation Warp Speed, can trace its origins back to Pl the Plowcourt Pharmacy, founded by Sylvanus Bevan in 1715 off Lombard Street in London. Uh, next slide, please. And here we can just see, right, an image of GlaxoSmithKline in London on the left and Plowcourt Pharmacy uh, off Lombard Street in London on the right. And, you know, you don't have, you know, Bevan and Plowcourt won't be showing up again in the rest of this talk, but I think this is an important point to make, right, that these makers and vendors of medicine in this period aren't lost the time to the to sort of the, the backstory of history. Right, they become incorporated, they get sort of taken up by the kinds of pharmaceutical manufacturers that arise in the centuries to come. And of course, this kind of bulk interchangeable imperial healthcare represents the spark of the take this for that one size fits most approach that has predominated for much of the past couple centuries in medicine. I can go into more depth on this point um, in the q and I also talk about it more uh, in the book. But for now, I want to turn back to Sylvester Gardner as our guide to some of the local impacts of these big abstract changes in the medicine trade. What did this burgeoning global trade look like or mean in New England? And this is where Gardner's case can be quite helpful. As in other transatlantic trades, such as agricultural produce or rum, there was money to be made in the medicine trade which would alter the lives and ecologies of many across the region and beyond. Since no large-scale drug manufacturing yet existed in British North America, colonial practitioners and traders relied on transatlantic trade to maintain their stocks. Next slide, please. Here we can see some of the glass vials used for exporting medicines. Various tinctures, elixirs, pills, plasters, were packed into glass vials and then wooden crates in London to cross the Atlantic, during which journey they were subjected to corrosion and spoilage and leaky holds or total loss, such as when ships sank or were captured by privateers. Sometimes chemical reactions could occur between various salts, seawater, and other goods to cause explosions and holds. Yet despite these challenges from 1720 to 1774, the value and weight of recorded annual medicine exports to New England increased more than eightfold. The region surpassed others, with the exception of some areas of the Caribbean, right, thinking of enslaved populations, uh, in importing medicines, which were often resold via coastal trade networks. Gardner's income from selling medicines exceeded that of an ordinary medical practitioner by perhaps sevenfold. His apprentices, John Dennison Hartshorn and William Jepson, kept busy preparing orders for rural medical practitioners, military regiments, merchant seamen, and settlers across Connecticut, what is now Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, and Nova Scotia. One 1769 sale to Robert Southgate of Hardwick, Massachusetts, totaled just over 23 pounds value, nearly twice what most residents earned in a year. Many medicine sales were small, daily things, right, thinking walking into an apothecary shop, to buy an elixir for a nagging ailment, right? Or like a plaster or an unguent for a wound. But that Gardner's sales could be quite large, however, underscores the variety and quantity of items he supplied to his customers. Uh, next slide, please. Excellent. Right here, uh, I've included in one of Gardner's advertisements from one of the local Boston newspapers. So you can see here, or if you take a moment to read that, uh, you can see sort of the variety. And what's important to take away, right, is the variety of goods he's offering. So these large quantities, the freshness, uh, you know, referencing both apothecaries and doctors in town and in the country, right, his large distribution networks. Right, he supplied medical stores for, he also supplied medical stores for military expeditions. Right, for both the Massachusetts expeditions to Niagara and Crown Point, organized by Governor William Shirley in 1755. So all this is to say, right, a vibrant regional trade in medicines, both finished products and ingredients, emerged across the region in the 18th century. 
supported by rising demand from sizable military and mercantile communities and requiring the use of indentured and enslaved, and enslaved labor. And this is something I'm thinking about for future projects as well, that there is a hidden labor history of medicine in here too. In London's laboratories and in the various kitchens, workshops, and shops of the colonies that enabled men like Gardner to accomplish what they did. Right, the New England medicine trade was similarly dependent on the plantation economy, colonial resource extraction, and warfare, even if those ties are a bit more hidden than if we consider healthcare on a sugar plantation in Jamaica, for example. You know, merchants of medicines in port cities like Newport, Rhode Island, and Boston, Massachusetts found lucrative customers in the merchant and military ships, right, in Boston Harbor, the slave trading ships moored off Newport, as well as the wealthy investors and capital holders who lived comfortably in those cities, having invested, right, in those transatlantic trades like the slave trade. And right here in Maine, we can find one of the many, one of many local consequences of this commercializing and globalizing medicine trade. Based on his success in these other ventures, as well as the social capital they accrued to him, right? Remember, he's having dinner with the Quincy's and the Hancocks and things like that. Gardner bought shares in a land speculation company in 1751. As a proprietor of the Kennebec Company, Gardner found access to provisioning and lumber trades that took advantage of his experience in the transatlantic and regional medicine trades. Land speculation. So now I'm going to turn to land speculation and think about trees. Land speculation, and by this I basically mean purchasing land from away with the intention of developing and renting it for a profit in the future. It already had a long and complicated history in northern New England by the middle decades of the 18th century, right before Gardner ever got involved. The Kennebec Company, formerly incorporated in 1752, upset a fragile equilibrium that had reigned in Maine since Dummer's treaty ended Father Raleigh's war in 1727, as it aggressively, right, as the Kennebec Company aggressively developed a claim of about 3,000 square miles along the Kennebec River. Next slide, please. And here is an excellent hand-drawn map by the historian David Gear uh, that shows your know, representation of Maine at the time with the Kennebec Company's claim sort of with that dotted line. Uh, in the middle. The company built two forts, Frank Fort and Fort Western, established a dozen towns, cleared much acreage, settled hundreds of families, intimidated opponents, and clashed with agents of the crown over forest rights. Uh, next slide, please. And here we have a map produced by the Kennebec Company uh, of their claims in the region that's held in the collections of the Maine Historical Society um, in the Kennebec Company's records collection. So we can see here their depiction. Um, I'm sorry, the format of the slide led to be cut off, but you can see those, those rectangles in the center top are sort of their representation of their claims in the region. Right, and the Kennebec Company's records reside here at the Maine Historical Society, providing a deep look at the inner workings of a land speculation company in the mid 18th century. These records, when combined with Gardner's other papers that I found in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, fill out a portrait of one outlet of the transatlantic medicine trade at the intersection of so many different threads of early American history. Right? Combining the economic, right, seen here, with sort of the medical, is one of the pillars of my approach to archival work. Reading early modern medical terminology can be challenging, as can be deciphering early modern weights, measures, and monies. Yet by wading through all of this, right, historians can underscore the closeness of even these similarly disparate enterprises, right, which perhaps right, uh, don't seem that disparate anymore, but right, health and commerce, and show how they've influenced each other's development over time. And so right, where do medicines fit in, though? Right, and this is where I'm going to go next. So thanks in part to his previous decade's success in trade, Gardner could become one of the Kennebec Company's largest sources of credit for the region's development. It also allowed him the opportunity to expand a diversifying medicine trade into a new regional market. Gardner had a 50-ton sloop, the Kennebec, built to transport people and goods and used for his other business in the Gulf of Maine, which had come to include provisions, including grain, meat, 
arms, building materials and medicines. For the supplies he sent to families on company land, Gardner was compensated with credit or land, uh, which were desirable returns from trade at the time. When the Kennebec River froze in the winter, Gardner sent his ships south to Carolina and Virginia, where his agents purchased crops for the upcoming year. The ships left Boston laden with molasses and sugar, and they returned carrying tobacco, grain, lard, and pork. On the other end of this trade, certain New England trees and their byproducts contributed to the maintenance of British military and economic power through shipbuilding, dyeing, right, textiles, and medicine making. This isn't quite the triangle trade that we tend to think of linking Africa, the Caribbean, and the American colonies, but it is another of the many linked trades of commodities that defined this early modern Atlantic world. In one case, Donald Cummings, a physician who owned portions of a mill in Biddeford, provided Gardner an estimated 40,000 lumber boards each season in exchange for a supply of medicines. Gardner in turn sold that lumber to customers across Massachusetts and Connecticut, who in many cases already partook of medical care and products from him. Samuel Watts, for example, purchased cordwood, shingles, and merchantable boards, in addition to medicines and attendants from Gardner from 1758 to 1772. Gardner's ships could each transport about 15,000 pine boards, proceeds from the sales of which became pork, wheat, corn, or rye for provisions to go north when not able to go directly into Gardner's pocket in the form of cash or bills of exchange. With their large diameters and heights, white pine, uh, in particular, held enormous economic and military value across the Anglo-American world. Europe faced extensive deforestation in the early modern period, so the old growth forests of North America, especially those of New England, offered an alternative source of masts for the Royal Navy, right, which as I mentioned previously, lay at the heart of British imperial plans. The best masts for high tonnage ships came from single straight trees, as you can perhaps picture, White pines were bigger and lighter, though less resinous and flexible than the Baltic firs that had been the primary mast trees in England, encouraging the Navy to adopt the white pine as its new standard by the early 18th century. A host of legislation, collectively known as the Broad Arrow Policy, protected and reserved the precious large trees in the North American colonies for the Navy. Right, New Englanders, though let me be clear, or that these are people who expropriated native lands in order to be considered New Englanders, uh, defied the broad arrow policies from practically their implementation in the 1690s, since they proved almost impossible to enforce due to the size of the area covered and the lack of crown agents available for the task. Right, imagine the even greater woodlands of Maine and New Hampshire uh, today, right back then, being policed by a handful of crown agents, right, who are underpaid under served with material and help. So a really daunting and impossible task. Though agents of the Crown at various points certainly tried to enforce these laws, you know, uh, you know to varying levels of success. And then fast forward a bit to the 1760s, right? So implementing the 1690s, we're gonna fast forward a bit to the 1760s when lumbering operations including the Kennebec companies, had expanded dramatically in spite of the laws. In, 1770, in 1766, its lumbering provoked the ire of John Wentworth, Surveyor General of the King's Woods and Royal Governor of New Hampshire. For the next seven years, uh, Wentworth sparred with the company over the Kennebec's white pine. This was not the first conflict between a Crown representative and the proprietors over masteries. The Kennebec proprietors had clashed with Wentworth's uncle, Benning Wentworth, the previous surveyor general in the 1750s, prompting creative workarounds, such as shipping boards from their claim to New London, Connecticut, rather than to Boston to avoid the naval office there, right? Which, you know, we can, that's, you know, that's, that's kind of akin to smuggling, right? To avoid the naval officer where they'd have to pay taxes and have their lumber scrutinized by instead going to a different port that had a differing level of right, uh, bureaucratic infrastructure. A tangible and my personal favorite example of this tension over trees can be seen in the floorboards of the Pineborough Courthouse up in Dresden, built in 1761 along the Kennebec River in the proprietor's claim. 
Uh, next slide, please. Right, we can see here some white pine on the left and Pineville Courthouse's front facade on the right. Right, the three-story building features 45-foot supporting beams and a 52-inch wide plank on the third floor landing above spaces used for a tavern and a courtroom. Right, I'm gonna underscore that a 52-inch wide plank on the third floor landing. Such a wide plank suggests the builders had used a tree with a circumference of over 13 feet flouting the law, right, and above a courtroom, no less, right? Trees reserved for, um, sort of just thinking about this sort of, phys that there are physical traces of the tensions over this law um, and the development of the region. And trees reserved for the crown are still out there, right? You, I've, I've heard tell that you can find white pine in the main woods still emblazoned with the king's broad arrow on them. So if anyone knows the location of any pine with the king's mark still visible on them, please let me know after, after the talk. So despite the strategic importance of mast trees, it was usually more profitable to cut lumber than masts in the main woods, as the courthouse uh, implies. Pines felled in violation of crown policy accounted for much of the lumber produced in 18th century New England. This lumber as boards and staves was then profitably exported to the Caribbean and other Atlantic destinations. In some areas of Maine, lumbering became the equivalent of a monoculture, so that settlers depended on imported provisions for much of their supplies, according to some reports. And of course, logging and paper mills remained essential to Maine's economy for a long time thereafter. Parts of local trees also possessed medicinal uses. The bark, needles, and twigs of white pine could treat kidney problems, for example. Right, you can see that the parts of trees mentioned in medical texts and recipe books are the parts not typically used for shipbuilding or lumbering. In his American Herbal of 1801, Samuel Stearns noted the stimulant, diuretic, detergent, and antiseptic properties of turpentine made from white pine. Balsam of turpentine, the thick material remaining in the still after the essential oil has been removed, could be found throughout early modern medicine recipes. Gardner used various turpentine mixtures and balsams in his medicines. So I can only surmise whether these ingredients arrived from Maine as a byproduct of this lumber trade. Unfortunately, those notes don't survive. Turpentine, tar, and pitch from a variety of pine species gave unguents and plasters, right, uh, topical things for the skin, their sticky consistencies. But you may be more familiar with those colonial products in other industries, right, such as shipbuilding or textiles. The hackmatack or tamarack tree, better known as the eastern larch, became prized in wooden shipbuilding in the 18th century, while its bark was valued for its therapeutic properties. The Micmac, for instance, used hackmatack bark to treat colds, fevers, and infections. Resources extracted from Maine in one way or another became part of Sylvester Gardner's regional and transatlantic commercial ties during the 18th century, reflecting a similar trend happening across various long distance imperial trades. Gardner's position within knowledge and trade networks set the conditions for his position within the Kennedy Beck Company that in turn enabled him to exploit the land and labor of Northern New England for several decades. As a proprietor, Gardner extracted rents, sold provisions, felled trees, and angered many people. That these ventures relied on credit and connections from the medicine trade further entangled British medicines and colonial natural resources. Not only were popular medicines made from colonial plants, but they also helped fund their extraction. Now I'm going to begin to wrap up. When the Continental Army confiscated what they could of Gardner's estate in 1776, after he had fled Boston with others deemed loyalists, they found more than 2,000 pounds value of medicines, an impressive stock given a single medicine chest sold for around 20 pounds. Seeing the diversification of Gardner's enterprises, medicine seems less of a calling than a way to gain wealth and status, especially as the portrait of his second wife, Abigail Pickman from 1772 also suggests. Next slide, please. And here we have Copley also painted a portrait around 1772 of Gardner's second wife, Abigail Pickman. And this portrait right depicts her wearing a fashionable Turkish-inspired dress 
right, in a pose reflecting the family's social standing. Right? As, you, as you look at this, sort of consider the, the vibrant colors right, achieved in the painting, but also we presume right, achieved in the, the garment itself, right, with dyes, right, which are valuable and expensive, the rich textures of the heavy fabrics, right, you can see the, the heavy fabric, right, these, these quality goods and attention to fashionable European styles underscores the family's position in colonial society and trade by the end of Gardner's nearly 40 year career. And seeing the ways Gardner leveraged medicine and connected it with other extractive processes, right, felling trees, et cetera, illustrates some of the motivations behind an expanding medicine trade in the ways it touched many corners of the British Empire in this period. His experience is not unique, perhaps somewhat rare in terms of scale, right, but Gardner's is by no means unique in terms of strategy or actions. The manpower and energy needs of empire were significant and consumed medicines alongside trees, people, and so many other things in ways that we're still figuring out and dealing with uh, the consequences of today. And this is just one small piece of that story. I wanna you know, really conclude here by zooming out for a moment to put this information together, right, in one other way. The story of early modern medicine, like early modern land speculation, is one of wealth, status, and power. Within the framework of overseas empire, manufactured medicines change the prevailing expectations of healthcare, bodily potential, disease, and work across colonial and metropolitan spaces. In short, this is a story about how commercial, material things reshaped perceptions of immaterial and abstract things, namely of nature, the human body, trees, and the relationship between all those things. Shifting expectations had implications for ideas of inherent difference between people who looked different, altered communi communities of health and healing around the Atlantic world, and degraded colonial ecosystems. These are all still challenges we face today, whether in the Maine woods or beyond. Thank you. You can go to the final slide. Thank you, Zachary. Um, that was really interesting uh, and really informative. I'm going to leave your, your contact information up there for just a moment. Um, but just remind our audience that if you have questions for our speaker, you can type them into the chat and into the Q&A feature. feature. Uh, I would like to start us off uh, with a question of my own. Can you speak a little bit more to how you utilized the collections at Maine Historical Society for your research? Certainly. Uh, on the one hand, I found the collections, I didn't really know what to expect when I first arrived at the Maine Historical Society. I had seen that you had resources pertaining to Sylvester Gardner and his involvement in the Kennebec Company, but I did not know the extent and the richness of the Kennebec Company papers that you possess at the Maine Historical Society. So I looked at those papers for, in a particular way to understand Gardner's role within the company and his sort of the ways that he leveraged his different ventures to gain a foothold in the company and profit from the kinds of business that they were doing in the region. But there are so many other ways, right, someone could read those sources and others have um, for, for different ends, thinking about, right, the real sort of physical development of this region of Maine, local political conflicts, I mean, I use several maps in the book uh, from your collections that are excellent and so informative. Um, the depth of records, right, really enable me, but also others, right, to see a land, a company of individuals brought together to exploit land, right, and profit from it and see all the different facets of that endeavor um, and where it fails and where it succeeded, right, and everything in between. Thank you. Uh, someone is uh, saying, um, one of our listeners, Sally, uh, says uh, that they learned so much uh, this evening, and thank you. Um, and she's curious, uh, or they're curious, what is your personal connection to Maine? Well, uh, thank you for the question, Sally. I uh, appreciate the kind words. Uh, yeah, and I, I have, um, I have my, some of my wife's family uh, currently lives in his from Maine, so I have 
fond memories of visiting them and spending time in the States. And as you heard me allude in the talk, uh, I also like to be outdoors. So do have this interesting relationship with Maine in that I've been able to connect my history work to material uh, examples of that that still exist in Maine, right? Whether that's Tate House or Conboro Courthouse or right, the structures on Swan Island, um, there are these still tangible uh, examples that make it really cool for a historian, right, to make those connections uh, in person too. Brenda is asking, um, did uh, Gardner learn anything from indigenous people on using natural medicines in the area? That's a really interesting question. And one that right, historians of medicine and sort of historians of colonial America, like myself and others, really struggle to answer in that, right, a big problem of history, right, is that we're beholden to the sources left by people who left who left stuff, right, to put it bluntly, right, the people who could read and write, to people who left records that were deemed worthy of being preserved, right, that, that you know, if you think of sort of a, as an archive, right, not necessarily now, but even in the past, right, um, all the time in between, sort of what is deemed worthy of being preserved is a difficult question, um, and the answer to that question has changed over time. Right, as the society's priorities have changed. Um, this is a long way of saying that records sort of that speak to that cross-cultural interaction are rare, particularly in terms of medicine, because oftentimes that sort of medical relationship is seen as one of strict power differentials and of sort of suspicion or fears, right, of some sort of medical system that looks different. And of course, in other cases, there are really well-documented examples where you know, medicinal plants and sort of techniques are able to make that jump and do get incorporated into European medical practice in, in one way or another. But I don't have any, I mean, we see Gardner using medicinal plants that have come from native peoples elsewhere in the empire, right? And have traveled across these large scale uh, trade networks. So that's really interesting to see and think about, oh my, right? This thing must have come from South America or South Asia, right? but I don't have any record of action, of interaction in Maine itself. Um, although of course we can speculate, right? He's using things like castor oil, right? Which in colonial New England, right? Are being used in medicine and other sort of manufacturing techniques coming from native traders who are trading that from the interior. So we can make some hazy inferences, but I don't have any sources of a direct interaction like that. Sure. Nancy uh, asks, what's next for you? Uh, what are you working on now? Uh, another book maybe or, or something else? Uh, I'm working on a few articles right now, one of which uh, is pretty fun, if I, if I can say that, is sort of working on a book chapter to, for, uh, to you, for undergrads to learn how to use sources uh, in the history of medicine in their undergraduate schoolwork. So thinking of it as a primer of how to approach sort of these business records of the medicine. Mm. I think that is sort of one of my specialties is sort of thinking about medicine, but thinking about this commercial side of it. So how does an undergraduate student use an account book or a ledger or patient records or something like that in write, writing a college paper or something like that. So that's one thing so from a more educational standpoint. But in terms of other things, I've pushing beyond the book, right, this other question of how did people at the time interact with medicines? Right, we can see if they bought or sold it, right? We can read diaries to see if they used them. But I'm interested in finding examples of how did, you know, tasting, smelling, really understanding these fragrant, colorful, bitter, sweet, acidic, right, mm -hmm. substances that people are putting on their bodies and putting inside themselves. So. I'm sort of trying to get at that material lived experience of medicines in the past a little more and how I'm going to do that. I have some ideas, but how I'm going to do that is an open question, but that's sort of where I'd like to push this kind of thing going forward. Interesting. We're getting some more questions about Dr. Gardner specifically. Nancy asks, did he have any major competitors in the medicine trade in New England? Yes. Yeah, there Right, there are, right, he definitely rises to the top in terms of social capital, sort of stock scale distribution, right? He's 
shipping medicines to Nova Scotia, right? Sort of thinking about that as an extension, right? Of sort of this North Atlantic coastline, right? Um, but he does, and it, it, is, it is interesting to see how these fault lines break, right? When uh, political tensions rise in the 1770s, right? There are other sort of mid to large scale makers and sellers of medicines, right? Martin Brimmer is one whom I talk about in the book. He actually joins the Sons of Liberty in Boston and is named by a British newspaper as one of the sort of top 60, you know, members, right? And he sells to, and his business uh, continues during the revolutionary conflict. Whereas Gardner, because of his sort of eliteness and political leanings and religious affiliations, decides to flee Boston. So gives up his houses, his medicine stock. Um, there are certainly big vendors of medicines, as I, as I allude to, in Newport, Rhode Island, right, which has a vibrant, you know, it's a vibrant port city, big hub of the American slave trade, uh, so a lot of supply of ships. But yeah, if you're in a port city, you can find people vending medicine. Um, and the competition could be especially fierce for people like Donald Cummings, right, in a you know, bit of furred, a sort of up and coming mill town at the time, or, or not mill as, right, but those are like processing lumber, right, mills. And in sort of those areas, people claiming to be a doctor, claiming to have medical experience, selling their, you know, their, their skills as a doctor, there could be a number of them. And he often complains in his letters to Gardner of feeling so much competition, and that he thanks Gardner for supplying him with good medicines that he can sort of try to differentiate himself from the pack. So I think that's where a lot of the competition is in this sort of middle tier of individuals marketing their attendance and medicine in some of these sort of developing uh, communities outside of the sort of port cities where you have these more established merchants, right, who have these transatlantic connections that are hard to come by. So in that way, sort of Gardner's a little bit protected from competition because of these long distance ties that he's mm -hmm. cultivated. You touched on this a second ago, uh, but Laurie is asking what eventually happened to Dr. Gardner? Did he play a role in the Revolutionary War? Yeah, the, well, the Revolutionary War is a really interesting one in terms of the history of medicine. Uh, and I speak about this in my book and others uh, write about this as well. But right, if you think about it, right, wars are an incredibly awful time right, for, for humans, and, and particularly in terms of, right, injuries from war, as well as the sort of spread of disease between, you know, um, regiments and people who are away from home, you know, subjected to sort of extreme physical conditions and things like that. Um, so on the one hand, the American Revolution really sparks American medicine manufacturing, because these transatlantic ties, right, that Gardner and others rely on for imports of medicines in many ways, get cut off, right, when mm -hmm. Britain legally ends trade with the American, with its North American colonies. And so they have to look to other ways, whether that's the French, the Dutch, or making them right in cities like Philadelphia, where a really vibrant medicine manufacturing begins uh, in the 17, 1775, 76. Um, it really sparks that. But, and so some people actually find lucrative business during the American Revolution. There's others like Gardner, because as, as I said of his political and religious leanings, right, he decides to flee Boston his medical stocks get confiscated by the Continental Army, get distributed to regiments, right? So they get used. Um, he eventually goes to New York, uh, and then he eventually flees to Nova Scotia, and eventually ends up in Poole, England, where he lives for a time. And right, all of his estates and property get confiscated by the Committee of Sequestration in Massachusetts, and some of his main lands get rented out, some get given back to his descendants. Um, the portraits of him and his second wife, Abigail. <sighs> Unfortunately, I have to admit, I forget which one is which, but one goes with the family to England and one stays in what is becoming you know, the United States. You see these sort of different provenances that sort of speak to the experience of a lot of loyalists, right? Mm -hmm. um, sort of divided experiences, right? Where do they belong um, at this time? Interesting. Richard asks, when was this shift from four humor diagnoses to external disease sources, when did that happen? And is there any sense of the steps that it in, involved into what becomes germ theory? Like, how does that figure in? Yeah, well, there's, a, well, it's, there's no, as with anything sort of in the history of medicine, 
at least in the early modern time, and even today I'd argue, right, there's no real sort of clean, bright line where one thing becomes another. So we see even in the 18th century, um, we see people still referring to the humors and referring to the effects of climate and moods, even as they're talking about medicines that are specifically designed for specific diseases, right? So we see them sort of competing, coexisting, um, but this idea of sort of an ontological framework right, that diseases are something that threaten the body from outside, that's coming into vogue right in the 1600s. And we can sort of trace antecedents of this, right? Plague, certain diseases, plague is always seen sort of as an external invader. That was never sort of an imbalance um, thing. So there's some, and it's not like new, but it's coming more into popularity for a wider variety of ailments in the 1600s. And as I argue in the book, these sort of exigencies and needs of empire, right, of manpower, of waging war, sort of push this sort of very convenient way of thinking about disease and body more into the forefront of British healthcare um, over the course of the 1700s. Um, and, right, and that does lead into germ theory. I mean, there are many steps along the way, right, sort of dead ends and false starts, right, the sort of more mechanistic views of the body. But, right, we can definitely sort of put that on that line. But I do want to say, right, that it's not necessary, like at this time that I'm talking about this in the book, we are not necessarily ending up at germ theory, right? There are a lot of different ways, dead ends, false starts that this could have gone um, before getting to germ theory. One last question for you, uh, Zachary from Anne, um, who says she, she came to the talk a little late. Can you just re refresh um, why and who we're, we're throwing um, Gardner's servants into the Kennebec? Yeah, well, right there, there are these two examples of this where Gardner as a you know, landlord, landowner in Maine, he gets approached by a group of settlers or people who rent the land and live on the land uh, in 1774 and again in 1761. 1774, there's a few more sources and uh, he, his, his, the, 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 um, the minister at the local church says that they are, right, they throw um, they sort of threaten him. They want to find the tea that he's hidden in his house, or right? they're crying for liberty, sort of taking up those calls that are increasingly spreading across the region in 1774. But the fact that they throw his surveyor into the river and threaten his life and threaten the life of the minister, right, shows that there are some sort of religious tensions, right? Gardner's a high Anglican, right? The church in, Dres in Powellboro, Dresden, right, is an Anglican church at the time. Um, and that flies in the face of a lot of the other kind, right, other sort of um, types of Protestantism in the region at the time, right? The targeting of the surveyor suggests, right, that there's discontent over demarcations of land. Um, we know that there's political strife with other sort of municipalities in the region, for lack of a better, like this casts it really sort of pushes back on the proprietors when they try to expand their claim. So there's a lot of this sort of debate over who should own the land, how much rent should be extracted, um, where are those boundaries, where are the obligations, right, of those people. And if that's a topic um, that any of our listeners are interested in learning more about, um, we hosted a program with Alan Taylor last year on Liberty Men and, and Great Proprietors, and you can see that recording on our website. So if you haven't seen that yet and you'd like to learn more about that topic, uh, please, please visit our website. And our website, uh, mainhistory.org, is where you'll be able to find the recording of this program in a few weeks. It's also where you can learn more about how you can do research at Maine Historical Society, about how you can visit our museum, become a member, learn about upcoming programs, visit mainhistory.org. Uh, the book is Merchants of Medicine by Zachary Dorner. You can purchase that book through our museum store at mainhistorystore.com. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, thank you, Zachary, for this, uh, this wonderful discussion. Uh, good luck with the book. I know we're all looking forward to reading it. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Oh, this was lovely. Thanks so much for having me.